Hi there! In the last video I did, which was the restoration of that DeForest Crosley receiver, I had a bunch of people request to see what's inside these little white boxes that I've built that protect the input and the output of my spectrum analyzer. Now I work on a lot of high voltage gear, you know, vacuum tube gear, and the rough high voltage in, uh, say, an everyday vacuum tube receiver that has a transformer in it would be around 300 volts DC, and that's called the B+. Now the last thing I want to do is feed that into the input of my spectrum analyzer or into my tracking generator output. So these little boxes are designed to block DC and they also very lightly couple my spectrum analyzer into what I'm aligning. And I'll get into a little bit more of that at the whiteboard right over there. Here's what's inside that little white box. It really is quite simple. We have eight capacitors here that are in series. They're 500 volt, 100 picofarad capacitors. So that gives me four kilovolts of isolation. And since they're all in series, I get 12.5 picofarad of coupling. Now you've seen in the videos when I'm doing my alignment, even 12.5 picofarad is a little bit too much. So what I do is I clip the alligator clip to the insulation on the wire in order to get the signal through. And that's about maybe a picofarad or more of coupling into the circuit. And that's on the grid cap lead from the tracking generator in. And that's also on the uh, last IF output transformers wire that connects to the diode plate in the receiver. And there's about a picofarad of coupling there also. Remember, I'm using one of these on the tracking generator output and on the one meg ohm input of my spectrum analyzer. And that's another thing I have to mention. This circuit here is designed for a one meg ohm input system. So if you put this onto your 50 or 75 ohm input on your spectrum analyzer, your results will vary. This actually needs to be modified a little bit to run on that system. Now, if you have a 50 ohm tracking generator output that's going through here, that's absolutely fine. When you hook the one meg ohm input of your spectrum analyzer through this box to the other box on the tracking generator output, it's completely flat. There's no problems there. But again, when you put this onto the 50 ohm input or 75 ohm input of your uh, tracking generator, it is not flat. It actually looks pretty linear. It's you know like this. So that's unfortunately the, uh, the way that things go it's with this particular unit anyways. Again, a little bit of a modification. You could probably make this absolutely fine to work on the 50 ohm input. It's just I didn't plan to do that because this is designed to work with high impedance circuitry. So I have it on the high impedance input of my spectrum analyzer. So now this is 4,000 volts of isolation from this alligator clip here to this part of the stack. I would never test that at 4,000 volts because the box is so small and uh, the area between the capacitors is very small. So I imagine the breakdown would be a little bit less than 4,000 volts. So I wouldn't test that. Uh, for most receivers, you're dealing with a 300 to 500 volt range inside the receivers. So not a big deal for this whatsoever. I still shudder when I hook the alligator clip up to high voltage though. It's just, uh, you know, input of my spectrum analyzer. That's a real touchy piece of equipment and uh, that spectrum analyzer works absolutely flawless. So uh, I'm very careful with what I do. Now, this is the kind of the glory of this little adapter here, okay? You have all that isolation right here up to say 4 kV if it was gonna hold that up. I imagine if you potted that whole area, it would probably hold up to 4 kV. Uh, I would never try it, and I don't suggest you do either, especially if you're playing with a, uh, you know, a really nice spectrum analyzer. And of course, again, if you're going to be hooking this up to any high voltage circuitry or you're working on any high voltage circuitry, you're doing so at your own risk. So just take care. And if you're going to build this and hook this up to your spectrum analyzer, you're also doing so at your own risk. Make sure that you put this together correctly and, um, you know, and test your circuit before you actually apply any voltage to it because uh, you don't want to damage your input. Spectrum analyzer inputs are very expensive to fix. Okay, so again, the glory spot of this thing here is, is that, okay, if there was supposedly some form of arc over in here, we have diodes here on this side that will allow only a positive or a negative five volts to be at this particular point. Anything over five, it's gonna clamp it down. So that's a little bit of extra protection right there. This is a limiting network so that only you can get about 10 volts peak to peak through this whole system and that's gonna be all that's gonna travel through this. This will start to clip at about 10 volts peak to peak. So remember, we have you know either positive or negative five volts is all that's gonna be able to get through. If there was a DC voltage present there, that's all that's gonna be able to get there. And then this would clamp down. And of course, we have another capacitor here just as a little bit more protection right to the input of our spectrum analyzer. 
This here is a little bit of a strain relief here. Any of you that have played with any kind of a BNC connector or used BNCs over the years, uh, BNC connectors with lots of mileage on them, the center conductor sometimes gets a little bit loose and that tears up traces on circuit boards and stuff like that. So this here is just a little, a uh, little kink of wire there that uh, allows a strain relief. So if that does for some reason get loose, it'll just break the wire and not wreck the little circuit inside. And that's all that that is. And I suggest that whenever you build anything with a BNC connector, unless it's soldered directly to a piece of FR4 board or something like that, if it's if it's right on the board and the, you know, the center's uh, soldered there, usually it's pretty solid, but there is a bit of a gap between the plastic box and the actual circuit board itself. So uh, this here is a little bit of a relief between that point there. And this here will just break if something ever does happen. So this is 0 0.01 microfarad, and this is a 50 volt rated capacitor, that's all that it is. Uh, these again are 500 volt rated, so they're uh, very, very safe. Uh, the reason that I use these capacitors is because I have a lot of them. I have a whole roll of these capacitors, and these are all C C0G capacitors. Um, you know, don't need to be like that anyways. It's just for testing. You're feeding a signal through it and, and all that kind of stuff, but uh, this is just what I had on hand, right? So I use what I have. Now, uh, I put a jumper adapter here just in case I could put a little, uh, I think it was uh, an 0603 or 0805. I forget the actual size of the pads there. I can use a zero ohm jumper, and I can jump out four of these capacitors if I want to up my coupling to 25 picofarad. If you up it to 25 picofarad, you are then losing two kilovolts of isolation and you only have uh, 2000 volts worth of isolation. Again, I would never test that at that because the board is very small and it is not potted so that I can service it and uh, if something ever happens or whatever, I just, I didn't pot the board. And that's pretty much this. These are just alligator clips here on the end. This ground is connected to this ground to this ground. It's a pretty thick trace on the board out to this alligator clip right here. And uh, this is that high voltage flexible test lead that you see right here. And that high voltage te uh, flexible test lead is the same stuff that I used in that DeForest Crosley receiver, that little loop that you saw onto the center shaft of the, uh, of the band switch. That's exactly what that stuff is, is multi-strand silicone. Um, you'll see it in the box when I show you the little box there. And uh, that's pretty much it. My spectrum analyzer puts out uh, 0 dBm, which is about 0.224 of a volt or 1 milliwatt worth of power. Uh, that's dramatically lower than this diode stack here. This 0.224 of a volt is going to be coming out of here. This will handle 10 volts peak to peak. The reason that I did that is so I can use these boxes on a signal generator or anything else that I want to lightly couple into a circuit so that I'm not limited off. If you wanted to limit this down a little bit more, you just can remove some of these diodes. Now these are BAV99s, which are two diodes in one SOT23 package uh, a device. So there's six devices. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, and you'll notice that one is up and one is down. So, you know, that's creating a, a limit at 10 volts peak to peak. All right. Now there's two diodes in one package. These are very fast diodes. Uh, you could get away with using uh, 1N914s or 1N4152s or anything like that. Some, some really fast glass diode would be absolutely fine. So let's head on over to the uh, to the bench here and check out what's inside this little unit and then we'll look at it on the spectrum analyzer. And I'll explain why it's important for these little units to be flat when you're doing an alignment on, um, on any kind of receiver. One other thing I will mention before I go, again, if you have watched any of my other videos, uh, in or uh, the least amount of coupling is the most important thing to have whenever you're doing any form of alignment. So if you can get away with running a picofarad of coupling into the circuit and out of the circuit, that's awesome. Because the more coupling you have, you're adding more capacitance into the circuit that you're tuning and stray inductance. And you don't want any of that because when you remove your test gear, you've effectively tuned that inductance and capacitance out in your circuit. So your response pattern is going to change. So the least amount of coupling to get the signal in and the least amount of coupling to get the signal out is what you want. Again, you want your test gear to be invisible to the device under test. You don't want them to see each other. You want the radio to think that it's just operating normally and the signal is just coming from somewhere. Okay, that's the whole trick of doing a proper alignment. If you overcouple onto the grid cap of say the mixer tube or if you overcouple to the last IF transformer output, when you're adjusting the slug on that last IF transformer or when you're adjusting that variable capacitor in the top, like on the DeForest Crosley, you'll be tuning out 
you're, you know, you'll be working on that response pattern, but what's also affecting that response pattern is this stray capacitance that's imposed by your test lead clipped into the circuit and also the stray inductance of that test lead. So remember, one to two pico fried if you can get away with that. That seems to work very, very well uh, with the 3585B spectrum analyzer. Let's check out what's inside this little box. So you can see I've removed one of the screws already and they're self-tapping Phillips screws. So the first time you run these screws into the box, they tap a little extrusion that holds this lid on here and then after that they thread in and unthread really easily. It's a really soft plastic so they go in relatively easy the first time anyways. Now the reason that I've chose a plastic box for this application is because this is dangling inside chassis a lot and there's a lot of high voltage circuitry that a metal box could short out on. So by having a plastic box it kind of uh, saves you from doing any kind of damage. Now when I've got this BNC on here and this is an exposed collar here, I'll, I'll put a piece of black tape around it or you know slide a piece of heat shrink up over that BNC connector and in that way it's absolutely safe if this is in any kind of a um, you know real tight environment where I might touch something. So these are real handy boxes. They're made by Hammond and I bought these many many years ago and I've got the number written on another open box over there. I'll go grab that in just a second here and I'll tell you what the boxes are. They're really cheap. They're about $1.50 or something like that and uh, they're great little boxes for projects like this. So this is what's inside the box here. I'll zoom on in. Now this camera doesn't zoom anywhere near as close as the uh, my old camera there but uh, I think it gets the point across here. So right about there. Now, these are the capacitors here in the stack. All right, so it's about 12.5 picofarad of coupling here. And I've noticed that I've tapped it a little bit further down the stack than the uh, 25 picofarad. So there's only three capacitors in. And I didn't tap it right at the uh, 25 mark, I believe, because I wanted just a little bit more coupling for a signal generator. Now, I didn't draw the schematics out. This is just all right off the top of my head from what I remember. I didn't even take any notes on this. I just put this together very quickly because um, I needed something for my spectrum analyzer here very fast. So I didn't have any notes. So um, there, there's one little amendment to what you see on the board there. It's tapped just a little bit further than the uh, 25 pico fried mark. Now, I'm not even using that, and I never have, because I've just used these for uh, aligning IFs and radios and and I find that 12.5 picofarad is, is enough coupling anyways for anything that I, at least that I'm doing. So this little uh, little jumper here isn't populated it's just left open and that's a uh, looks like an 0603 part would fit on there. So we have 12.5 picofarad of coupling from this point here to this point here. You can see that I've got this trace really close to the ground here. So there's a you know a very very small amount of area there, and that's if if something's going to arc over, I want it to arc over at this point here. I don't want anything to get up through this stack and get to the diodes, and that's the reason I did that there. So if it can jump that gap at that point, that's uh, pretty dangerous. And I would say that I would probably be able to get to about 1500 volts uh, around there before that gap would start to jump. So that's a little bit of extra protection. Now again, I don't ever plan on taking this, you know, above the three to 500 volt range at maximum because this is basically used for tuning receivers and, um, and stuff like that. So a little bit of extra protection right there. Now this runs into these BAV99 diodes, which are right here. There's six of them here. And that's that diode stack. And then there's that 0.01 capacitor that runs to the center conductor of this BNC connector. This here is that little strain relief that uh, I've noted in the, um, on the whiteboard there. You can see there's a really stout connection from the ground lead all the way up to the shell of the BNC over here. And I want that because I don't want the ground to ever break. All right, this is this high heat uh, silicone test lead wire. Now, this is very good stuff. This stuff here is uh, very flexible, uh, lots and lots of strands. It's the same kind of stuff that I used in that DeForest Crosley receiver on that band switch there. You can see it's got one black layer and then another white layer in the center. Now these holes that I've drilled in the box right here where these test lead wires run through are a little bit smaller than this silicone uh, uh, outer jacket here. Now I've tapered the holes so it doesn't cut the silicone, but in order to get these silicone wires through you have to oil them up and then press them through. And then of course that creates quite a friction fit at the plastic here. And once you take the oil off here, these are tight and you don't need to put any strain reliefs in. 
Now that's nice for easy replacement. If I want to replace these wires down the road, if one of them breaks, all I have to do is clip the inside, clip the outside, and just press the little center piece out, and away I go. Just put another piece in with a little bit of oil. This would never, ever come out. That is extremely solid in that box, and that's exactly the way that um, I intended this to be. Now this is, is not not intended for high frequency use and uh, anybody that's been in the RF game will know that already because of these long clips here we have a lot of lead inductance here so I primarily use this for IF alignment and this is for lower frequency use and we'll take a look at the frequency response on a spectrum analyzer right up to about 40 megahertz and that's the top of that 3585B these two little screws here mount the circuit board to two smaller extrusions in this box here. And this is the box right here. And that's what it looks like with nothing in it. So you find two small screws and then just thread them into there. Now when I got this box, it didn't come with any smaller screws for these um, smaller extrusions. So you'd need to find a smaller screw for that. But they do come with these two large ones for the lid. And you can see here it is a Hammond 1551G. That's the number of the box. These are real handy little boxes. I bought a whole bunch of these things quite a while back and I've used up a lot of them. And in fact, I've made a few of these for my friends as well so that they, uh, with their spectrum analyzers, don't have any issues. So that really is how the box works and uh, what's inside. So off to the spectrum analyzer we go and let's check out this little uh, item's performance. Let's check out the performance of these little white boxes. So the first little box here that you see is attached to my tracking generator output. Now my tracking generator output is DC coupled so I need to be very very careful that I don't back feed any DC back into my machine or I'll ruin my tracking generator. It's exactly what these little boxes are designed to protect me from doing. These little boxes will block DC but only let the signal through. All right. This box and the other box are designed around a high impedance system, but it's okay to drive this box from any DC coupled 50 ohm tracking generator. The second box is hooked to my 1 meg ohm input on my spectrum analyzer. Again, this blocks DC as to protect the input of my spectrum analyzer and will only let the signal through. This is designed to be used in vacuum tube gear, that's why I designed this around the 1 mega ohm input on my machine. Most vacuum tube gear is pretty high impedance. Now what we want to do is we want to see how flat this is through the entire range. Now we can use the entire range of my spectrum analyzer to see this is a 20 hertz to 40 megahertz spectrum analyzer. So this is a lower frequency spectrum analyzer, but it is very, very good for sweeping IFs, and uh, it's very good for a lot of RF use. In fact, this is um, a very, very nice spectrum analyzer. If you have a chance to ever get one of these things, I strongly suggest it if you're uh, doing the kind of stuff that I'm doing. So since this starts out at 20 hertz, I'm not consider, you know, concerned about going down to 20 hertz because that's audio frequency. So I intended these boxes to really work in the RRF range. So let's uh, see how flat these are from say, um, we'll go start frequency 100 kilohertz and we'll go stop frequency 40 megahertz. So that's basically, you know, uh, 40 megahertz is the top end of this machine. That's where this machine stops. So from 100 kilohertz to 40 megahertz. Now, now what I'll do is I'll hook these boxes together and we'll see how flat they are through the entire range. So I gotta reach around my uh, tripod here. It's kind of difficult. This is uh, reaching here. There we go. So they're put together here. I'll just put these back down on the bench so I can free up my arms here a little bit. So there we go. So we have a start frequency of 100 kilohertz all the way to 40 megahertz up here. And we're dealing with about a six dB difference from end to end. That greatly exceeds what I had planned for these boxes. Now I basically do RF alignments, you know, on old receivers in the kilohertz range. So as you've been seeing, I've been doing RF alignments at, you know, roughly around 455 kilohertz. Now, when I do an alignment at 455 kilohertz, I usually want to see a span of about 20 kilohertz. So if I want to do that, I need, I need to make sure that my machine is flat within that 20 kilohertz. Whenever you're going to do an alignment, you want to make sure that this is absolutely flat from start to finish. 
So if I'm going to do an alignment at 455 kilohertz with a span of 20 kilohertz, I need to hit start frequency 445 kilohertz and stop frequency for 65 kilohertz. We're completely flat within that range. Our center frequency will be at 455. You can see 455 at a span of 20,000 cycles or 20 kilohertz. That's what we need out of these boxes and that's exactly what they're doing. So for a span of 20 kilohertz, absolutely no problems, completely flat. So I really doubt that I'm gonna use these boxes, you know, with a greater than, because I use these for sweeping. So I really doubt that I'm going to, you know, be using these for anything more than say, you know, two megahertz or anything like that. So uh, let's just try say, um, oh, start frequency nine megahertz, stop frequency 11 megahertz. We're absolutely flat within that range as well. So we have, we're completely flat within two megahertz of sweeping right here. We can see that our center would be at 10 megahertz here in a, a span of two megahertz. And that's really what I intend with this. I'm not really trying to look at an entire, you know, the, the entire 40 megahertz spectrum with, this, uh, with these boxes. Uh, they're designed for being tied into vacuum tube gear and for doing sweeping use. And uh, of course, aligning IFs. And this is exactly what, uh, what I intended. Now keep in mind, we're running right now at, uh, at nine megahertz all the way to 11 megahertz with a center of 10 megahertz with open leads. All right, let's pick this back up again with open leads right here, just like this. And we're still absolutely flat. And that's exactly what we want in any design because if we have a dip in this design like this, we cannot do an alignment because if we want to do an alignment, we're going to have this to compensate for and we're not going to know how to compensate for that. So what we want to do is always when we're doing an alignment, you always want to test your test gear to make sure that you're flat from beginning to end. If at that point you're flat, you can go through and do your alignment. So all in all, these boxes worked out very well. In fact, they worked out even a little bit better than I expected. This video, it went so fast. It's like it was here and gone. <laughs> it's not like those radio restoration videos. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up and hang around. I'm pretty sure there'll be many more just like this coming up in the very near future. So on to the next project. See you next time.